So good morning. Welcome to the third annual Beyond Belief meeting. We're at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. And um, I'm extremely glad that you all came today. Um, our task, as, uh, as we put in the program here, there's something of a challenge in here, and I want to read it to you. It's just a reminder of um, Carl Sagan's quote, that science is more than a body of knowledge, it's a way of thinking. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the key manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues when the people have lost the ability to set their own agenda or knowledgeably question those in authority, when clutching our crystals and nervously consulting our horoscopes, our critical faculties in decline, unable to distinguish what feels good and what's true, we slide almost without noticing back into superstition and darkness. Um, some of that is prophetic. And one of our duties here, one of our tasks, is to at least address some of this and see if we can light some candles in the dark, which is the subtitle of this meeting. Um, a series of conversations here, and our project is to foster and promote the use of reason in formulating social policy. And the candles in the dark I mentioned to are people's potential solutions to problems that they've identified, some that we'll identify in conversation here today and tomorrow in their areas of expertise and passion. Uh, sometimes it's awfully hard to do this. Sometimes, um, sometimes other people kind of do it better and set the bar rather high for us. So um, when you're trying to explain to people about evolutionary psychology and adaptations in the Stone Age, sometimes it's easier to just um, hob straight away a cartoonist has got it for you. And male-female differences, male-female brain issues, um, they, they seem to capture that pretty well there. Um, Anthony, Gray, Anthony Grayling's talk uh, <laughs> almost immediately is done for you. And um, Sam's remarks about Sarah Palin, I think, um, we've already got them done. So we have these serious issues to discuss as well. We have people here from uh, Science Debate 2008. We do need to know what's happening, the, the place of science in the society. One of the people who actually couldn't come today uh, is Norm Augustine, um, who um, wrote an editorial in Science last week pointing out that um, the huge disparity in the numbers, uh, the members of Congress, I think it's 525, don't, I, I may be slightly wrong, of whom I think uh, seven are scientists or uh, doctors, uh, whereas the, of the leadership of China, the nine leaders in China, eight of them have science degrees don't know what to make of that, but uh, we should at least possibly consider it. Um, we have a lot of stories about um, being able to tell people's predispositions by looking inside their heads with a scanner. Uh, there's a story here from India only a couple of weeks ago about a woman being sentenced because the judge deemed um, the, the, the brain scan was indicative of, let me find this out here, uh, a judge explicitly cited a scan as proof that the suspect's brain held experiential knowledge about the crime that only the killer could possess, sentencing her to life in prison. So one wonders sometimes exactly how far we should be going with all these things, and there are cautionary notes to be sounded here, which is why we have the sessions on neurolaw, um, which I'm looking forward to immensely. And then, of course, um, not all the story is correct. When we first learned about the monogamous voles and the polygamous voles, uh, it seemed like a fairly simple story from Larry Young. I remember Pat Church and Terry and I hearing him tell this story a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. Now it turns out that there's a bit of a twist on the story. Um, so reporting science, how science is reported, is one of the things that we need to be deeply concerned about. Pat will doubtless uh, comment on this at some point. And one final thing in communicating uh, all of this stuff, what can we possibly do to try and get a better story out there about science? This is a current issue of Oprah. Um, Oprah, of course, as you know, has a book club. She has, she, she has an enormously wonderful task in directing people to reading. Uh, if you look inside this issue of her magazine at her private library, of which she is immensely proud, there's 1,500 volumes. They're all beautifully bound. I don't see a single science title in there. There may be, but I don't see one. And I think it would be nice with the power that people have in the media if they would do something to, uh, along those lines. 
So um, this is essentially, uh, as, as those of you who know, have been here before, this is essentially just a large conversation. The agenda may change. Uh, think of it as la a large dinner party. Um, and my job, basically, is to, is to serve the dishes and move them along, move the food along a little bit, uh, which is why I'm dressed like a waiter. Um, but do remember Milton on his blindness. They also serve who only stand and wait. 